Well, wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in London and to, to speak to such a, a specialized uh, audience. I thank uh, Judith and the, and the um, Institute for this and, and Dave uh, Bannister and, and the folks of Article 19. I am now beginning as a board member and, and it is also my honor to be a board member of Article 19 with whom I have worked very closely all of the time of my uh, mandate, um, six years of the mandate, to uh, exchange many views and now to do it formally as part of the structure of Article 19 as well. And uh, as Judy was saying, I'm now, I'm based in Florence. Um, I was commenting with my cousin who is here also in the audience that uh, when you say you're doing human rights, and I, I come from Guatemala, by the way, from Central America, so I know what it is to be an activist with human rights running around the streets with the military behind you. Uh, and all of a sudden, doing human rights from Florence sounds like a bit strange. Um, many friends have said, there's worse places to do human rights. <laughs> um, but the reality is it gives me the opportunity to continue doing a lot of the freedom of expression work I did as La to continue supporting partners and to engage with partnerships uh, such as Article 19, and we would love to do academic issues with the Institute if possible. We're now working in research with the University of Madrid, we came back and there as the Institute for Democracy and Human Rights that we have for Internet and Human Rights at the University. So, this is a little bit the, the background of why I'm here today. The mandates of all rapporteurs since the Commission was transformed into the Council, are generally all normalized at three years uh, per term and with a maximum of two terms. So I, I did my, my two consecutive terms. And I must say it was very painful to leave it because I was enjoying it very much and I liked it. And I was, this is an area where there's a lot to be researched and many new things to be established. But on the other hand, I, I do believe it is very important to bring new air and new blood and, and ideas to the UN system, which in a way, uh, although I defend the UN and the, the procedures in the system, I think it's, it's a system that is getting to be very slow and ineffective. We can also talk about that as well. Uh, but in any case, I'm, I'm very pleased now to be back as an activist doing it from my civil society organization. Today we have three topics, basically, that, that I would like to, to relate, and, and there are um, all of them leading into the privacy and then into the, to the uh, last resolution of the European Court. One uh, was my reports on internet. I did two reports on internet, one for the Council and one for the General Assembly. And when I did the reports, I kind of thought at the beginning is what's new. I'm not an internet expert, and I would say that I, I, I was trying to bring the human rights focus to the internet, which is different. And the reason why I think they were successful is precisely because of that. Internet has always been analyzed from the possibilities of the new technology and how this technology is evolving, and those that are researching the technology, internet has been analyzed from a commercial point of view, and how much it has grown commercially of how huge corporations mushroom out in, into the world economically. Uh, has also been analyzed as uh, policy issues by states, but there had not been a, a human rights focus brought to that. And I think that was what people found new and, and relevant. And it's funny because one of the issues I said is that when we talk about regulations of internet, internet grew rapidly because of the type of technology it is, and, and that facilitates not only communication, but new research and new, new forms of communication, but also it grew because, it, in a way, there was very little regulation. It grew out of need, of, initially, of academics using it to exchange information, and then just it mushroomed into, into the different issues, including the social networks that most of us now use. So it was, the, in a way, the lack of regulation that allowed the Internet to move at that pace. Now, I think that we are at a stage where states want to put an end to that lack of regulation and not only want to be deregulated. As a matter of fact, this year we have the WISIS plus 10, the World Summit of Information Society meeting in New York to evaluate 10 years after uh, what has happened uh, with, the, with what were the initial concepts and decisions they had 
made. And I think we're in a dangerous moment because there are obviously also <coughs> the power of internet has been proven with the events in Tunisia and Egypt and, and around the world in general. And there is an attempt by governments around the world, even democratic governments, to either curtail the, the possibility to circulate the use of internet by limiting freedom of expression, or in some other cases, monitoring and invading privacy as a way to keep some degree of, of control. But in any case, they're all a bit scared about the power. And what I said in my report is that, ironically, the one regulation that we all have, which is universal and reaches out to everyone and to everything, are the human rights principles. So the one issue that can actually help us to understand internet is to apply human rights principles, because this is a unifying thing. Of course, there's many countries in the world that violate human rights, but, but the standards are there, the principles are there. So I said, internet has to be seen, and, and I mentioned it not as a right in itself, because internet is a technology, but the access to internet has to be seen as necessary for exercising the right of freedom of expression, the right of education, the right of research, of access to information, uh, the right to express cultural diversity, because this is where we find out about this in, in the world today, the right to free association uh, and assembly. People convene themselves through internet. And the right to develop. We're discussing the, the new sustainable development goals in New York, and believe it or not, there was a serious discussion among states whether to include freedom of expression in the Millennium Goals, because they didn't think it was development. They said, well, oh, those are civil and political rights. And, and it was, it's absurd. There, there is no possibility for any nation, and, any, and the peoples of any community and nation, to establish possibilities of development without being able to receive information, to transfer information, to discuss their issues, uh, from what they're going to produce, harvest, or fisheries, or, or, or whatever they want, to what's going to be the weather, what is the technical research, what is global warming, what is going to affect them in the world, or even the markets. What are the markets like in the world, and what's going to benefit them or harm them. So there's no possibility of development today for any community, from the small rural communities to the whole nation, without internet. And this is what I mentioned in my report. So it should be inherent to the right to development, which is recognized as a human right, and it should be inherent to the exercise of any other. And I went beyond that. I even said the states, therefore, should be forced to subsidize the access to internet. Access to internet should be full access in infrastructure, uh, connectivity, uh, software, hardware, and, and equipment, and in content. Access to content without censorship. And this was the two division. When I did my report, the two examples I placed was, was uh, China and, and India. China. It's the fastest growing country in connectivity. They're installing more. I mean, they, when I did my report, there were about 365 million people in China interconnected, the biggest total number in, in the world uh, for, for a country. But, at, but as a matter of fact, it's a very high percentage of growth. But in contrast to that, the, the, there's no freedom of access to content. All the content goes through the censorship of the party. We have the firewall and the control, whatever, whatever is uh, uploaded online. India at that moment, uh, this was <coughs> four or five years ago, five years ago now, uh, India at that moment had one of the freest nations in terms of, of use of internet and communication and expression, uh, very little or, or almost no censorship, high levels of technological development, Tremendous research in technologies of communication, but in contrast to that, only 7% of the population was interconnected. They have reached now, I think they have reached more, they are about 10%. But even that is, is obviously a very low for a superpower in technology like India. And I could say the same thing for many of the emerging, emerging powers of the world, that the, the, the economic gap reflects itself in the digital gap as well. Say the same thing for Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, uh, all these new, new new nations that are presenting themselves as, as big uh, powers. So what I said as a conclusion in my report is let's not let the internet become another element of the economic 
huge gap in the world. And let's not make internet an added element of the digital gap. On the contrary, let's use internet to bring communities together. Let me here use a little example of my own country, Guatemala, which has a gender element to it. And we work on, there's an NGO that I'm still a member of, it. in Little Guatemala, we were working on youth leadership around the rural areas, especially in indigenous communities, Mayan indigenous communities. And obviously in the leadership training, we, we, we treat, we develop the capacity building on human rights, advocacy, civic participation and all that, but we included internet, obviously, as one mechanism for communication and advocacy. And we discovered, in the initial exam, that 95% of men know how to use internet, because they can all go to a cafe net and a friend will show them. But 95% of women did not. So we discovered that not only did we have a huge economic digital gap, but we also had a huge gender gap, because parents didn't allow young girls to go to the cafe net because it was full of men. So, and, and this was, even though I come from, from Guatemala and I struggle against discrimination against indigenous peoples and against the levels of poverty, but even this finding uh, in such a dramatic way was, uh, I must confess, a shock for me. So, we decided to make the problem the solution. If internet is part of the gap, let's use internet to balance this gap. So, we began making a priority. We kept on training men, of course, but we made a priority of having always a majority of women in our seminars and courses. It was an enormous success. I must say women were normally more effective and, and learned faster than, than men. So it was very successful in the way that women felt empowered when they left their, their courses. So I could prove these things. I was a funny rapporteur because when all, many of these debates they had had only in the Western countries. So Talking about access to internet in Europe, <laughs> going to any coffee shop and, 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 and use the Wi-Fi there, you know, it's like it was a, a non, non-existent debate. But when you bring in the developing world, then it changed the whole, the whole issue. So that was number one, the importance of internet, but specifically how to see internet growing from the perspective of human rights. It is the exercise of rights through internet that makes the difference. And obviously freedom of expression, but not only freedom of expression. In those days, by the way, I, I wasn't uh, planning, which came much later, to develop. I, I also developed some reports on the misuse of internet. I did one on hate speech because of what happened in Oslo and the horrible assassination of children by Breivik. And eventually one on privacy because of what we discovered was being done by, by many governments around the world, including our own government. So this also has different values. The, the, the human rights focus can actually allow us to look at internet from different perspectives. From the exercise of our own rights, our communities of, most, of cultural diversity, of uh, rights of minorities and, and specific ethnic groups. But it can also help us to look at the abuse and the misuse of communication, or it can also help us to look at the abuse of power by states. All this comes from a human rights perspective. I'm not going to insist too much on that, but we can talk about it in the, the question and answer. Everyone anticipated it was going to become a huge debate, especially when I said that states had an obligation to guarantee and to some the same way that they subsidize electricity for the poor areas of the country, they have to subsidize connectivity and bring internet to the, to the world. Not a single commission protested. To my amazement, everyone was very happy with the report and no one raise the voice, uh, no one, uh, I even used an interesting example, uh, which I always mention because it is an interest. Uruguay, which is not, I know it's, as an example, kind of complicated because it's a big country, but the little population it has three and a half million people, and it's a very much a middle class nation, which helps in a lot of people things, but Uruguay did something interesting, they, the state controlled the broadband, and they made every public school a Wi-Fi server, so the, the, the all children can use internet with Wi-Fi coming from their from their own school, but it also the service is provided beyond the school limits to 400 or so meters around the school, so even parents or the community can actually get close to the school and use free Wi-Fi. And I emphasize the free because this is a free service that the state is, is giving. Then with the UNDP, they began giving one laptop per child. 
in primary school. They began in first grade in primary. They're, they're now up to ninth grade, that's the last time I saw, with 95% of children with a computer in school for free. The only commitment that the children have is to, to use the computer and they can never <laughs> sell it or, 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 or they have to give maintenance. There was a big debate in society where the children were going to destroy it. Teachers have documented how children protect their little laptops more than their own toys. <laughs> and and they, they even put a chip in the, the, each computer only works in that school. So no one can steal the computer because it was taken out of that, that service provider, uh, that Wi-Fi from the school, then it will not work, it will disconnect itself. So we don't even have that. So it's been the most successful program I've ever seen that, that brings solution to many things. First, how to train children positively in the good use of internet, not the negative use of internet. Secondly, how to use the technologies, how to update their, their whole education system. Now they're building, they're doing their electronic textbooks, so they won't even have to print them. Uh, they're doing a chess uh, Olympic games uh, throughout the country by internet. I mean, I could go on and on, but it's a very, very exciting project. Now, my criticism I get is that Uruguay is a bad example. It is because it's a very homogeneous country and it's a small country, but I said the determinant factor is the political decision of those in power and, and that they prioritized a serious public free service than a commercial uh, alternative for, for, these, for these children. Then came the what were the problematic forms of, of use of internet? In the hate speech I did this very much was Article 19, if anyone is interested, we can talk about that. We will talk about the five uh, benchmarks to determine what is legitimately hate speech. I'm not going to go through that now, but we can if we want. Uh, and, and the fact that Article 20 says the ICCPR state should prohibit extreme forms of expression, those that incite hatred, hostility, and violence on the basis of race, nationality, and gender, race, nationality, and, and uh, religion. And I would add gender, disability, um, sexual orientation, and others. And because today, I mean, this was the reality when the Universal Declaration was written and the ICCPR, but today we have many other forms of, of hate speech that are producing serious violence. Uh, I did a report on, on electoral communication and how, for instance, homophobic speech is becoming an issue even for electoral politics. Uh, this, by the way, is very serious in Uganda and, and in Kenya and in African nations a lot, the, the provocation of violence against homosexual population as a way to identify candidates and to gain sympathy. But having said that, it has also happened in Hungary, for instance, in Europe. So, it's not that any continent is free from obviously these uh, homophobic uh, speeches and aggressive speeches. And, and, and we have a return of racism, if you have all followed the news, the attack on this African-American church in, uh, in uh, South Carolina by this young boy who was pretending to be a white supremacist, uh, willing to use violence and to follow the messages of all those leaders of the white supremacy in the United States. So I think we have a return of hate speech, not only in internet, in everything. I think it's a return in hate speech in, in politics, in political leaders, and in some religious leaders, of course. And this puts us uh, in a challenge of how to use communication in a different way. I always quote UNESCO and the article, uh, the first article of the Constitution, one of the paragraphs, that's a very beautiful phrase that says UNESCO is established as an institution to promote peace in the world by facilitating the free flow of ideas and knowledge amongst peoples of the world. So it is basing peace on the free flow of ideas and knowledge between peoples. I think this is really the essence of it. Uh, when someone, an ambassador from Denmark uh, in, in Geneva, one of the debates said, when we have hatred, um, through freedom of expression, what is the solution? More freedom of expression, more communication. The fact that we have problems doesn't mean that we curtail the, the expression, but that we have to expand it beyond freedom of expression. 
But in that expansion, then, um, and precisely because some of these forms of speech are provoking violence, in some cases, we're going back to a geopolitical, I won't say ideological, because one could question very much how in this 21st century ideologies are going to be defined, but certainly geopolitical spheres of influence and debate, and, and how that is, uh, is sort of defining the narrative that everyone has, which is very clearly expressed in Europe and Ukraine. Uh, for, for the Russians, NATO was getting too close. For NATO, the Russians are invading a territory of a country <coughs> that's trying to join uh, the West, uh, culturally and politically. So clearly, we go back to this sort of horrendous debate with, in many cases, falsification of fact. I, mean, I think the challenge is for the press now, the journalism itself. I still have a column in my country with people. Uh, the challenges for journalists are enormous to me. How to define, again, a new ethics and a new approach, where I believe human rights plays a very important role as well, because ethics and human rights go hand in hand. And, and Enhancement of human rights training for journalists becomes a key, key issue in how to focus them. But the other abuse that this violence provoked, whether it be the religious violence, uh, extremism, um, which is really not, I mean, like, like someone said the other day on the news, in reality, no religion profoundly and truly can provoke violence. It is the misuse of religious language by some people which is being used to incite violence against others, trying to build differences and bridges. So it's the misuse of the message, which can be from geopolitical, ideological, to homophobia, to a religious uh, fundamentalism, but in reality it is promoting <coughs> violence for political reasons, using the disguise of religion. But in any case, this is provoking a lot of fear in government, legitimate fear. And this violence takes new forms of terrorism, the fact that people are willing to give their lives to make others die and suffer. And therefore, it began justifying the need for bigger surveillance and more surveillance. And I decided to do a report on, on privacy and surveillance. Since my, my mandate was not exactly that, I was extending my mandate, but there was no rapporteur at that moment. Now it has been created. Just uh, in the past session of March, the Human Rights Council created a new mandate uh, for a rapporteur on privacy and data protection. And they are now in the process of selecting who will be <coughs> the person with such a with such a mandate. And they will uh, probably be announced, I think, by the end of the next session of the council. Uh, but in any case, uh, I understand they're having problems in defining because there's a lot of, obviously this is a very tense mandate and there's a lot of discussion uh, amongst regional, regional groups. But in, when I did my report, it was logical. My logic of this was, if I'm defending freedom of expression, I can also look at issues that challenge freedom of expression. And one of the biggest challenges to the freedom of expression is with the breach of privacy. Because if we lose privacy in our communications, we will essentially lose the feeling of security to express ourselves. I always say that it's interesting freedom of expression is essentially the mental process of thinking of any human being. We seek information, we exercise our freedom of thought and opinion, and we express them, those thoughts and opinions. And if somehow in either the process of gathering information and the way we gather information, which includes a free press, that is broken, then it's affecting our whole process, our process of freedom of thought and freedom of opinion. But also when we express those opinions, it also limits that. And when we communicate with other people, and we want to do it privately, and those communications are being breached by someone, and being read by someone else, it also will limit, and it has what everyone like much the term, but the, the, the chilling effect that it makes sense. It has a chilling effect in the possibilities of, of expression. So anyway, I did this report on privacy, and my fundamental argument was clear. We do live in a more dangerous world. It would be 
absurd, they're denialists. I mean, we're looking at the reality. We're surrounded by violence, whether religious fanatism, which is probably the most visible, many would argue it's certainly not the most important numerically. It gets more covered, and it scares people more. It is the more visible one. But we also have, like I said, the, a, a, a brief growth of racism, the fact that many racist and, and, and white supremacist parties in Europe increase, or, or that Marine Le Pen was able to form the, the bloc of, of ultra-conservatives in the European Parliament is, for me, a very preoccupying sign. It's a terrible dome in Greece and the National Front in, in France and Northern League, La Liga Nord in Italy. We have these clear expressions of racism growing in political strength. So it means that the message is reaching someone. So this is something which you have to look at uh, ourselves. And acts of violence are, are happening. We have many countries at war, seriously, for many reasons, oftentimes for mistaken wars that were done in the past. But the fact of the matter is that I believe the states do have a legitimate concern in guaranteeing the security, not only a concern, an obligation to guarantee security to the citizens. So I began my report by putting that aside, saying, no doubt that we live in a more dangerous world, and no doubt that there is more incitement to violence. And no one is doubting the obligation of the state to guarantee national security and individual security to its citizens and to everyone, even non-citizens, to everyone who lives in their jurisdiction. But having said that, there is a way to guarantee security within the democratic process. If we believe in democracy, we think there is a democratic way to do things especially with a due process of law. So what is not permissible is to break that democratic process. And the logic of this is because when you have national security, you're not only protecting the individuals, per se, uh, people in, in the territory, or, or even those in power, you're also protecting the institutions of the state, because you want to have the state to continue working. And you also protect the democratic system of the state, you're protecting your model of democracy. So what's not possible is to have a contradiction between these goals. You cannot say that in the name of protecting my citizens, I will break democratic rule. Because then you're becoming an authoritarian nation, which is what's happening today. Everyone says, yes, we have to guarantee security. But in guaranteeing security, I'm taking away the rights of the people that live under my jurisdiction, under my territory. And therefore, I am the cause of the loss of rights and of making a nation more insecure. And this doesn't work. We came down to the debate of whether mass surveillance or targeted surveillance. If surveillance can exist, with always the, the three-part test. If it's established by law, it's in a specific procedure that has an authority of the state separate than those that are going to practice the surveillance. Because what's not permissible is that, which is what's happening today, is that those that are going to invade communications decide by themselves and for themselves what they want to do with little or no supervision. Yes, there are some courts, like the FISA court, that said at the end, look, this is so much that we lost control. We can't follow. So when you lose control and you're letting intelligence agencies or security agencies or police agencies at different levels be those that determine, sooner or later, and this is the tragedy of the world, but it repeats itself, sooner or later, that amount of power turns into political harassment against the opposition, against those that are criticizing the policies, against those that... This is the basis of democracy, the, the idea of defending the pluralism of opinion. Then anyone can be elected or not, yes, but also those that are uh, represented can also criticize or change those that are elected if they don't like the policies. But now it turns out that with this sort of pervasive monitoring of communication, everyone will become fearful of even criticizing minor public officials, a mayor uh, or, 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 or someone in, in, a, in a city council in the city hall, or, 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 or obviously members of parliament, or, or others. And this is 
probably would be the bridge of the one percent that we have seen. And if this happens, this actually weakens our country. So I keep on saying that the logic of presenting does not make sense because if you you act in an abusive way against your own citizens and your own population in, in, in the territory, you yourself are creating the harm of weakening the system that has protected the population for so long. And the trust that people may have in the system and, and those that you run. So it, it's interesting because on one hand, globalization has brought something very good, is an increased level of transparency around the world. Whether governments like it or not, there's more communication going on. But on the other hand, it also brings the weaknesses that we all have. Um, I read an article recently uh, called the, the Progressive Loss of Power of Governments. And this is an interesting concept because the theory goes that with the globalization, governments are becoming less and less powerful. Before, you had imperial governments. Very much made decisions that could be challenged by parliament, but but only the big decisions, but small issues were unnoticed or small decisions were not even challenged. But today, with the amount of information that flows, everything can be challenged. And, and everything and anything. In my own country, Guatemala, we have a vice president, a woman, first time a woman practically, very corrupt, who had to resign. She had to resign because of, she should be in jail. But <laughs> she, she resigned before being put it. She's still being investigated in May and other jail. But it's interesting, it was the level of information flowing. <coughs> and people were able to demonstrate that she was buying more houses than her salary permitted. It had many more properties. So it was very simple to add two and two. And plus then she had accusations of money laundering and internationally, etc. But here you have the second person of a country, the vice president, having to resign because of this flow of information. So yes, we have a growth of transparency, but this also generates fear in governments. And I think the reaction in many governments is that they are trying to become more protective of their information and the control of information of everyone else. So yes, more things are around, but there's less um, tolerance <coughs> for journalists to do investigative journalism and go nosing around. Why is Julian Assange still not allowed to go free, for instance, or Snowden? Because the revelations were a big scandal. Not even not a security breach, I think, for anyone, but it's a, a scandal for many people in power. These are things that people are not used to. Those that exercise power are not used to having to be accountable to many of the systems. So obviously, the, the, the question of privacy comes again and again. Uh, my report was obviously, I coordinated this also with Privacy and International. My report was very well received. Interestingly enough, it's another report that I expected some governments to jump and hammer me to the ground. And no, no, it was no one, no government was willing to stand up and protest against the defense of privacy. They all said, we all defend, believe in privacy and defend privacy. The one and only argument, and oftentimes I had with colleagues of the UN and called Rapporteur, was on the question of how to deal with terrorism. And that did come up. Yes, but in the world of a different logic, the logic of terrorists, you have to understand you need extraordinary measures. And this came down because of the mass surveillance or, or target surveillance. I said, look, target surveillance, you can always explain it in the three part test. That is, it is authorized by law and a specific authority to monitor it. Secondly, it has to be necessary to protect the rights of others. But it also has to be proportional. Uh, and the proportionality is you have to have a targeted uh, approach to, to surveillance. It has to have a time limit. It has to have an objective. Th those are the limitations to make it reasonable and proportional. And some people were saying no. Uh, I heard an argument that I found silly, but was presented. Oftentimes, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, so you're putting your hand in the haystack and scatter all the hay till you find the needle, but oftentimes you're not, you don't know what you're looking for. Yourself. So you still go through the haystack to see what you find. I said, that sounds like a formula for chaos to me. Okay, I'll surveil everyone and see what I find. And in the meantime, we all lose everything. And those in power 
get away with it. This is a very dangerous proposition. And the people that were presenting it were very serious about it. Were thinking, yes, this is the way to guarantee mm -hmm. security. Again, I understand this is a, a difficult conundrum because terrorism is difficult to confront and not always has the same logic. But we cannot act the same way. We can't act in a disorganized way. Again, like I said, we have to defend democracy as part of our national security and not attack uh, democracy. And then we, to not extend myself too much, we fall into the court decision of the year. And here I have a, a different opinion. I, first of all, don't think that the court, and it is true that I was invited by Google to be part of the advisory council just for that moment. <laughs> And one of my criticisms of the court decision is precisely because it gives Google too much power, and I told them that. And they agreed. They said, you're free to, to, to say what you want. And the point I was making is, first of all, I was only Latin America, and coming from Latin America, first of all, the court decision goes against our sort of track of thought at this moment. We're coming out of the military dictatorships of the past. And we're coming out of horrible periods like Europe came out of the Second World War or out of Bosnia and other moments. But in a way, for us, it's very important to free the flow of information, to reconstruct history. Because history is always being denied, especially by those that committed gross violations. We have a case of genocide in our country against the general who, can, the one country in Latin America had genocide in the 20th century. And, and we actually had a court decision in the, against the General Rivers Mont, and the Constitutional Court reverted it for minor little procedural aspects because they don't want to recognize the truth. The, the most difficult this debate, or the most violent debate in the discourse, uh, has been that of genocide in Oregon. So, and there's people that think that this is treason against the nation because we're tarnishing our reputation image. I've been accused of that. And I said, recognizing the truth never is a matter of, of harm to a nation. Recognizing the truth, that, on the contrary, raises the level of consciousness and the respect that anyone will have for a nation if it truly honors their, its own past. But anyway, so for us, the idea of the recoup what we call the recuperation of the historical memory, the testimony, the gathering information, the defining the identity of the culprits, and keep that in memory as well. Who were those that committed genocide? Because today we live with those military people still in society, normally with very corrupt businesses, because no just because they were able to, to live in impunity with no one signaling them. And this is not the way to, to have the country transform. We never had a serious reconciliation and national reconciliation because of that. So First of all, this is, like I said, the, the idea of erasing the past, for us, is, is complicated. Uh, this is not to say that we defend the right to privacy, which is different. I mean, I, I, I strongly believe in the right, but defining what can be um, erased from the past or not is, is, is complicated. Especially if we're dealing with who is going to run for public office, like, for instance, they... Europeans that were with me would say, uh, yes, there are exceptions, those that are in public office, all their life should be on record, regardless of what they feel about it. But I say, not only those that are in public office, what happens with those that want to be in the future in public office? The case in point in Spain was this man, I forget his name now, but who had had a bankruptcy in his past. And he was very angry that in the search engine, in the Google search engine, it always appeared in his record that he had had a bankruptcy, which has been defined by court, by the way, it was a legal decision. And this was very bad because he could not get a job. And he wanted that erased from his past. But I feel that I'm going to open a, a, an open contest to hire a manager in a firm who's going to administrate my funds. I want to know the past, and I want to know whether they had bankruptcy at some time or another. This is very relevant information for anyone who's going to hire him. And of course it will be difficult for him to get a job. But so be it. 
But this doesn't mean that everyone who made a mistake can say, okay, now, sorry, I made a mistake, but take it out, erase it. Life doesn't move that. Again, I must confess that I'm speaking from a different logic. We're from the logic of everyone should be on the record for everything they do. Uh, which is not the case in Europe. I, I recognize in Europe, uh, even on, on the criminal cases, after most of the averages of all criminal cases after 10 years, you raise the names of those that were uh, after <coughs> 10 years of having fulfilled their, their, their punishment. Uh, their names are erased from the record. So the case is there, but they're not identified who the person was. There's a big debate going on, for instance, even in the U.S. today, on sexual offender. Because there's women organizations saying it's more important to protect women in the future than it is to protect the privacy of one single individual, talking about the proportionality. Especially if it was a serial sex offender, for instance, or child abuse. It's more important for the society to know who these people were and what they did, and to protect the community and the society from this happening again than to say, okay, we can raise the name that can go away. Who knows what to do? I think it, it is terrible because I do know, and this is the, the only time I've ever seen a clash between criminal lawyers and, and human rights, because obviously all my friends who are criminal lawyers are saying that the whole idea of criminal law is that you can actually help people rehabilitate their lives and come back into society. This is the first thing. Criminal law is not for establishing a punishment per se, just because. It's a punishment to make people regress what they did and actually eventually incorporate in a positive way to society. So yes, there is a conflict in this. But in any case, what is the information? The one argument that I think is valid, this is the information. Who makes a decision of what is relevant information or not? I mean, someone drafted the famous algorithms, and obviously the search engine, what it does is it compiles information and puts it together. But in some cases, those algorithms may be more heavier toward, let's say, judicial records of individuals, or, because I don't think anyone in, goes through those files, particularly trying to signal someone, ah, this guy went into bankruptcy, I'm going to highlight that. It's all done by, 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 by a processing system that defines that with the, the, the way the algorithms were designed. So, is this entirely fair or not? And I think there has to be, I do agree, there have to be forms of defining when some of the information can actually be deleted because from the linked, not the really linked from the search engine because it is particularly offensive. Needless to say, in the case of malice, for instance, false information, if it is discovered that it was it was false information, or if it was only rumors, or it was but the, the irony is that most of this information that can be deleted from the, the search engine will remain in other records. For instance, the some of the information is in newspapers. So even if you don't find it, you can't Google it. You will be able to find it in a library by the files of those papers of that period. So it's not as if the information disappears, which is what people were thinking. I mean, I know that in this group of people, amongst you, people understand that. But the public opinion, by the concept of the right to be forgotten, thought that actually what you would do is erase part of the past if you really didn't want it. And everyone would forget about it or just simply not know about it. This is not true. History is history. But this is where we go into a serious philosophical debate. Uh, you cannot erase history. You can debate what is highlighted and what not. And this is what history is about. You debate with historians. You can take away what is malicious, what is false. Or you can clarify, or there should be a way to clarify uh, what, was, what, what was mistaken information. But aside from that, if it is true, um, and especially a lot of people, I mean, were, were worried about whether there was a sense of persecution. Now, this the, this hides what I think is, oh, well, and just to finish, and with the court decision, it even gets worse, because the court decision, I mean, I understand that in Europe, there was a sense of feeling that Google is ex excessively powerful, which is true. I don't think one single corporation should have that much power anywhere in the world. 
I told Google myself. I mean, this is, I understand the feeling in Europe. But the irony is, this is what the court decision does. They turn around and tell Google that Google should define the procedure in which to handle the cases where people are making a request to be linked information. So ultimately, the decision of the court goes back to the original problem, and the court simply left it in the hands of the corporation. And this is probably the biggest criticism with friends, lawyer friends in Europe, and us from other continents looking at it, is that it didn't solve the problem, it handed it back to the corporation. This is not the right solution. I think the state should never delegate this responsibility to someone else. It's like when prisons are given to private corporations and these things should never happen. The state is accountable to the people of the nation. Therefore, the state has to assume responsibility because it can be made accountable. If you delegate some of the responsibility to private actors, and, and even worse, to commercial actors, then what is the guarantee that it will be done well? I'm not saying that obviously Google is in the best interest of doing it well, which is why they convene it an advisory council, but as a matter of principle, I think it's a mistake, the court decision, to give it back to them. It should have never happened. Uh, plus the fact that they're calling it a right, and there is no right to be a it does not exist as a human right. I mean, so they, they, someone invented a catchy name for someone that, for something that does not exist. It's a delinking process in the search engine. And, and yes, it can be done in some cases, but in very qualified cases. The court decision is very weak. As a matter of fact, I was talking with Dunja Niatovic, the representative of the OSCE for Freedom of Media, and all the, 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 the Council of Europe region. And she made a statement against the conversation. She believes it doesn't, doesn't promote that approach. Now, let me tell you where you find other dangers that are real. For instance, what is happening with the profiling that many corporations are doing that people are not aware of? with real information that is in the social networks. People upload a lot more information than they think. Because obviously you put your name, you put your email, and whatever. But like a, a friend of mine beginning on the heavy side, put her photograph in, which is getting an advertisement on diet pills. And she says, I've never had a diet in my life. I'm very happy with myself and the way I am. <laughs> I've never done a diet and I've never gone through any... In, Obviously, they have an algorithm profiling photos. You know? Ah, this woman's a little bit overweight. There goes the diet pills. So this is very dangerous because yes, there are breaches of, mm -hmm. of, of, of privacy in the sense that what happens to the huge, huge mass of information that the social networks have? Where are they depositing it? Where are they keeping it? How do they protect it? Where is the responsibility to handle it uh, well? These are issues that, yes, we should look at, but these issues are not addressed in, the, in that court decision. And this is what worries me. And finally, one example, we had a case in the Inter-American Court on trafficking of children, but uh, a, a psychiatrist from Harvard made an interesting presentation of something that I did not know. She said that she discovered, she's talking about abolishing for paid publicity or commercial publicity for children under 12. Her belief is that any publicity, commercial publicity for children under 12, in any form, whether it be on internet, television, or radio, is a manipulation of children. Children are not a purchasing factor in society. They don't have the economic power, she says. Children are used to as intermediaries because then they can go nag their parents to buy them something. And normally it will be something with sweets, with sugar, with excess, with fatty diets and all that. She's right. I mean, I, I agree that I did a report on children as well, which I have also worked. But she said the worst breach is, is um, Mattel is putting out a, a, a doll in November in the U.S. and Canada, which is called Hello Dolly. Hello Barbie. Sorry. And Hello Barbie uh, is a, has a word processor that speaks back to the child. But what they don't know is that it does that because it hears the children and other people obviously have sends that information to a cloud where it's processed by Mattel and then it sends it back to the doll so the doll can interact with the child. Now obviously a little doll like that seems so inoffensive that no one is thinking that behind that little doll there's a huge cloud with a huge processor 
that is handling probably the biggest breach of privacy you can ever imagine in those homes because you'll have a microphone in every doll inside that house. No one is even talking about that. And this is going to be out for sale in November. These are serious issues. That is a breach of privacy. These are issues that, yes, there should be a court decision, there should be a court intervention. She was trying to organize a campaign to stop this. So let me finish by saying I am against the court decision of, of the Spanish case at the European court because it is a bad decision. It was badly drafted, but not because there are, there are no issues. There are serious issues of privacy in reference to the social networks and to, and to internet with big corporations that have to be decided. I think this is part of the new debate that's going to be coming up with the internet. In, in also in the WISIS plus 10 debate in, in the General Assembly. And I think we'll have to, we'll have to, to do that because it, it does, the handling of so much information does give corporations an enormous degree of power. Especially when you begin dealing with little small countries like mine, of course corporations know everything uh, and, and, and can have a tremendous political influence in the defining the future of small countries. This is something we have to look at uh, seriously and solve. I